Good morning, church family. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 11. We're going to read the first six verses of this chapter and then skip forward and read verses 25 through 36. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with him when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty God, thank you that you speak to us. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for even the deep truths of your word. Thank you that your word goes forth and it does not return void, but that it goes forth to call forth and create a people for yourself. Lord, thank you that your people includes people from all nations of this world, that Jesus is not only the Messiah, the long-awaited, anointed one of Israel, he is also the Savior of the nations. So, Lord, give us eyes to behold his glory by the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have your seat today. The summer of 2022 was historic in the Ritchie household, and part of the reason why is that Simon Peter Ritchie, our six-year-old son, learned how to swim in the deep end of the pool. And that's a big deal. This is something that he has dreaded for a long time, but yesterday, and this is new news, breaking news, he even went down the slide for the first time. And and this is such a a monumental occasion for us because Simon Peter Ritchie has been terrified of the deep end, and for good reason, right? The deep end of the pool is a scary place. The deep end of the pool can be a dangerous place. If you don't know what you're doing, the deep end is literally a place that you can get in over your head. But if you know exactly how to swim, if you're confident in your ability to swim, the deep end of the pool is also where you can find some of the most fun and excitement and joy at the swimming pool. And I bring this up today because I want to extend to you an invitation. Let us all be like Simon Peter Ritchie this morning because we are going to be plunging in to the deep end as it relates to the Word of God. Romans 11 is arguably one of the deepest sections of all of New Testament scripture. It's oftentimes a neglected part of the Bible precisely because it is so deep. For some, it may even be a little bit scary. 
we're going to address some of the most profound, some of the most complex questions that the New Testament poses. And, and that particular question that we're going to look at today is how are we to understand Israel in relation to the people of God? So with that in mind, we're going to explore three big ideas from Romans chapter 11, and they are as follows. Number one, Israel and the remnant. Number two, Israel and the church. Number three, Israel and the plan of God. So point number one, Israel and the remnant. I would argue that it is nearly impossible to understand the story of the Bible or the brilliance of the gospel without understanding the role that Israel plays in Scripture. The Old Testament Israel is chosen among all nations of the world to be the people of God, the people through which God will reveal himself to humanity. And so through the prophets of Israel, God reveals his words and his ways. Through the history of Israel, from the exodus to the promised land, from the exile all the way to the return, God reveals his character of mercy and justice. Through the worship of Israel, particularly the sacrifices, the priesthood, the temple, we are given these previewed glimpses of the redeeming work that Jesus Christ would later accomplish for our sake. But as Paul is writing his letter to the Roman church, many of his fellow Israelites have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. At the same time, many people from Gentile or non-Jewish nations are coming to faith in Jesus Christ in droves. And so this provokes an important but a very haunting question. And it's the very question that Paul uses to begin this passage of Scripture. I ask then, has God rejected his people? And the answer is, by no means. Of course not. God has not rejected his people. After all, Paul says, I'm an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I belong to the tribe of Benjamin. I can trace back my ancestry for centuries and generations. Paul certainly belongs to the people of God. But, and here's the crucial point, the reason Paul belongs to the people of God has nothing to do with his bloodlines or ethnic ancestry. And it has everything to do with his faith in Christ Jesus, the Son of God and the Messiah of Israel. See, earlier in this letter, Paul has already introduced a really radical new way of imagining what it means to be a part of the people of God. He said in Romans 9, For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. In other words, just because a person was an Israelite in terms of their nationality does not mean that person automatically is granted entrance into the covenant community of God's people. Even from Old Testament times, this was the case. This is not, in other words, a a New Testament novelty. The defining feature of the people of God has not been the flesh of Abraham. It's been the faith of Abraham. Sadly, Many Jewish people of Paul's own lifetime knew a lot about God, but they did not know God. They proudly proclaimed to be the people of God, yet through their own hypocrisy and their spiritual blindness, they strayed further and further away from God. They were more interested in justifying themselves before God through their works rather than resting in faith in Jesus Christ the Messiah. They were far more concerned with reestablishing the kingdom of Israel than hearing the good news, the proclamation of the kingdom of God in Christ Jesus. Nevertheless, from the people of Israel, God has saved a remnant who became the very core of the early church, the very apostles who declared the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. And that is the truth Paul wants to convey in this passage, that no matter how far gone, no matter how hopeless things seem for the people of God, God will always preserve and keep for himself a remnant. Paul writes, beginning in verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah and how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left. 
and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. See, Paul is interpreting his own situation in light of the Old Testament scriptures. And he recounts the story of Elijah the prophet, a man who ministered and was a faithful prophet of God, a faithful representative of God in an age that was defined by wickedness and compromise. Elijah had personally witnessed the power of God in utterly undeniable ways. However, when he looked at his own community, a fellow Israelites, he saw rampant idolatry, wickedness, unfaithfulness to the Lord. Many Israelites at the time were even worshiping a false god named Baal. And so Elijah felt lonely. And in his loneliness, he felt depressed. But God tells him in that dark moment, in that moment of profound sorrow, that he is not alone that he has preserved for himself a remnant of those who have not bowed the knee to the false gods that are around the nation. In the same way, I do think that there's a parallel. That it's easy, it's, at least it's easy for me to, to see moments where the church has failed, whether that's throughout human history or whether that's something that you see in the news, and, and to be devastated with the ways that the people of God continue to fail to be faithful to the Lord. Just like the Jewish people of the ancient world, there are many people who claim to be Christians, but the way that they live, the way that they speak, the way that they act in the world looks so much more like the people of the world rather than the people of God. What I want you to see is that this is in no way a new phenomenon. But even in the darkest of times, even in moments where it seems like the people of God are getting it wrong and failing all over the place, the word of God tells us that God will always keep for himself a remnant, a faithful remnant. As verse 5 says, so too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. For example, one of the more recent and very dark chapters of church history happened in 20th century Germany. Due to resentment towards the other nations of the world following World War I and Due to economic downturn and even fear of the Bolshevik revolution that had just happened in Russia, many of the leading German theologians and many leaders in the German church chose to support a leader who not only promised to restore the former greatness of the nation of Germany, but desired to work in and through the church. That leader's name was Adolf Hitler. In fact, one of the first things that Adolf Hitler does when he comes to power as the German chancellor is he installs what was called a Reichsbishop, a leader of the state German church that would ensure that the church would be in line with where he wanted the nation to go. He wanted the church to essentially be a tool of the government, a tool of his power, a tool of his agenda. And sadly, many German Christians in that moment thought it was the right and even godly thing to do to support him. But even in that dark moment, there began a movement of German Christians that opposed not just the ideology of Nazism, they opposed how the Nazis were attempting to exploit the church for their own political gain. They founded a movement known as the Confessing Church, which boldly rejected any authority that would attempt to assert itself over the church other than the Word of God. That they, they avowed to defend the proposition that the church is to be about the agenda of God, not the agenda of man. It is about the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of men. And the confession Christians refused to be used by Hitler. Instead, they resisted him at significant risk to their own life. In fact, the famous theologian, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, belonged to this movement of confessing Christians, confessing church. And he was later martyred because of his opposition to Hitler. What I want you to see in this is that wherever there is a simplicity of faith, wherever there is loyalty to Jesus above all other loyalties, wherever there is desperate hope in the grace of God, there the Lord has kept a remnant for himself. But we too must be discerning of our own hearts. 
We must not be judgmental towards the Jewish people of old. We must not even be pharisaical even unto the Pharisees. We must learn to be suspicious of any way that we are clinging to our own works or are attempting to justify ourselves before God on the basis of anything that is not Christ Jesus. As Paul says, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Thus, we must be a people that are ever humble, always open to God, allowing him to surprise us, uh, allowing him to reveal himself to us. We must always be utterly dependent upon God's grace. Point number two, Israel and the church. God has saved a remnant of Israel. But what about the rest of Israel? What about those who are still trying to justify themselves on the basis of their own works through the Old Testament law? Well, Paul has some very hard truths to tell. Look at the next few verses of chapter 11, beginning in verse 7. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it was written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. If this were where this passage ended, it would seem like Israel has stumbled and fallen from the grace of God. That there would be no hope for Israel. No, no more purpose for Israel, but that is simply not the case. Paul continues, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Somehow, through Israel's rejection of the gospel, salvation has now come to those who are outside the nation of Israel, who are outside of Jewish ethnicity. The good news of the kingdom of Jesus Christ has now been announced and it is spreading like wildfire through the ancient world. And even as Paul is writing the letter to the Roman church, it's less than three decades from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now there are churches composed of people from all kinds of different nations, people that are gathering as communities worshiping Jesus as the risen Lord in places like modern-day Turkey, and Greece, and Spain, and northern Africa. Now there is even a church, a gathering of believers in the imperial city of Rome itself. Now that's extraordinary, but it does provoke an immediate question that has garnered quite a bit of debate among Christians, and especially among scholars. And that question is, well, what then is the church's relationship to Israel? It's a good question. And I do believe that there are two extreme ways that we can answer that question that the book of Romans is going to hopefully help us avoid. The first extreme that I think it's very helpful for us to avoid is what I would call extreme replacement theology. Replacement theology, or extreme replacement theology, is the belief that the church has simply replaced Israel altogether. That Israel has no more relevance. That essentially Israel is the scaffolding And the church is the cathedral. So once the cathedral is built, we no longer need the scaffolding. We can just throw it away, dismiss it, disregard it. And practically what this turns into is a view of the Old Testament that is really profoundly low. I mean, you can have Christians that go to church their entire life. You can have entire Christian denominations that utterly neglect the relevance of the Old Testament. God's inspired spoken word. Because they feel like, well, that had to do with Israel. The New Testament is all we need to listen to. Now that the gospel has come, we don't need to care about any of that old stuff. But even worse, 
This sense of extreme replacement theology can even justify a sense of anti-Jewish hatred among Christians. And sadly, tragically, there have been moments in Christian history where Christians have had unbelievable hatred and animosity toward Jewish people. Essentially, extreme replacement theology untethers the gospel from how God has revealed himself in and through the story of Israel. But I would argue that the other extreme is just as dangerous. And I would term that other extreme as redundancy theology. In this view, there is essentially two different and separate ways that you can be a part of the people of God. Option one, all you need to do is be an ethnic Jew who faithfully observes the commands of the Torah, and you're in. Option two, just trust in Jesus for your salvation. Now, in this view, people who are ethnically Jewish and belong to the state of Israel, the nation state of Israel, are the true people of God. So if you're ethnically Jewish or if you're a part of the, the nation state of modern-day Israel, you're truly God's people. Christians are just a different version or a redundant type of God's people. And so, Jewish people are welcome to believe in Jesus, but the salvation that Jesus offers is only a redundancy to what is already theirs by virtue of their ethnicity. And this, too, is a massive distortion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For example, I once listened to a pastor give a sermon against the pitfalls of extreme replacement theology. And I think the sermon was well-intentioned, but he overstated his case in a way that created this cascading effect of other theological problems. He said, and I quote, If God abandoned his first bride, meaning Israel, then how can we be sure he won't abandon his second bride, meaning the church? And I think some people that were in the room realized that I was not liking or enjoying the sermon very much. So someone asked me afterwards what I thought about the talk that was given, to which I responded, God does not have two brides. Make no mistake, there is only one bride of Christ. There is only one people of God. There is only one way, truth, and life to salvation, and his name is Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through him. And so we have to understand the church of Jesus Christ neither as a replacement for nor a redundancy for Israel. The church of Jesus Christ is the covenant community of the people of God, both Jew and Gentile, who have been united in faith in Jesus Christ. If you're a Gentile and you have trusted in Jesus for your salvation, you have been grafted into the family of Abraham. Paul illustrates this concept by using this very extended and somewhat complicated illustration from the world of ancient Mediterranean horticulture. It's an extended illustration, but it is a brilliant illustration. And so we're going to be now taking a deeper plunge into the deep end of the pool, but we're going to unpack it together. Let's begin looking at verse 16, and we're going to read through verse 24 of Romans 11. Paul says, If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off, from what by nature is a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivative olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Okay, we'll pause and try to unpack that a little bit. Paul's setting up this analogy, and it's between two different types of olive trees. 
Olive trees were grown all across the Mediterranean world. And Israel represents this domesticated olive tree, um, something that has been genetically modified and genetically essentially trained over centuries and years to be a, a tree that bears bigger fruit and better fruit and more fruit than their wild cousins. And Gentile nations represent wild, undomesticated olive trees. And interestingly, the olive tree was first domesticated in the region of the ancient Levant. That's exactly where Israel is. And by the time that Paul was alive, domesticated olive trees had been planted all across the Mediterranean basin in places like Greece and Italy and Spain. And this, of course, is why it makes such a brilliant analogy for understanding the church of Jesus Christ. Because the olive tree spread in the same way that the gospel did. Faith in the gospel also spread out from Jerusalem into Judea, into Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. You see, each olive tree variety is actually a little bit different from region to region. And what's the reason for that? Well, farmers would oftentimes plant a domesticated olive tree in a new place, and then they would graft in a shoot or a piece from a wild olive tree that was better acclimated to the region they were trying to grow the new plant. A great example of this practice is seen in a, in a now a living monument that is known as the olive tree of Uves. It's located on the island of Crete. And it's now not only a monument, it is the oldest olive tree in the world. It's at least 2,000 years old. And there are some scholars that even believe it could be as old as 4,000 years old. But even at its very youngest, the amazing thing is that this tree was alive and bearing fruit when the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans. And it's still alive and bearing fruit today. Scientists have studied this ancient tree, and they have found that it has two different DNA strands. The first comes from an olive tree that was domesticated in mainland Greece, and the second was from a wild olive tree native to the island of Crete that was later grafted into that domesticated plant. And in this way, the olive tree of Oves is a vivid illustration of the church of Jesus Christ. Israel represents the domesticated tree, the family of Abraham, God's covenant people. But where some of the original branches were pruned or broken away, that represents the rejection of the Messiah by Israel. Other branches from wild olive trees representing Gentile nations were grafted in to that same covenant root. And now people who were once alienated from the people of God have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now people from all nations can come into the covenant community of God's people that spans both space and time. I want you to get how profound this is. What a privilege it is to belong to the people of God. Because if you're a Christian, if you trust in Jesus for your salvation, you are a part of the same church, the same spiritual community as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You belong to the same people as Peter, James, and John, as Augustine, Luther, and Calvin, as Reverend Spurgeon, and Professor Lewis, and Dr. King. And I know that these are big ideas that, that stretch our brain. So to make a very complicated matter as clear as I can, I want to share three sentences with you that I think you're going to be able to hold on to, that I think encapsulates the brilliance of this theology. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. It is a profound and a beautiful truth. Point number three. Israel and the plan of God. Millennia and centuries ago, God promised Abraham that his family would be blessed and that through his blessed family, the nations of the world would be blessed. And God has been faithful in keeping that promise. Abraham's family became a nation and that nation became a kingdom, a, a people named Israel in a promised land. And though Israel endured judgment and exile due to their sin, due to their faithlessness, through this one nation came the Savior of all nations. And though many in Israel rejected their Messiah, countless people from all nations have now come into the community of God's people. But the last thing 
in the world that Gentiles should do is grow arrogant, grow judgmental, become wise in our own eyes against those of Israel who do not yet know Jesus. We must instead note both the kindness and the severity of God, knowing that God is good, he is gracious, but he is also holy and just. He is kinder and more merciful than we could ever comprehend. A broken and contrite heart he will not despise, but he fiercely opposes the proud. He fiercely, ferociously contends against all versions of human righteousness that would set themselves against him. So for the people of Israel who do not believe, our hearts should not burn with hatred or judgment or condescension. Our hearts should burn with the same evangelistic desire as the Apostle Paul. We should do what we just did earlier in the service today, which is to pray that God would send revival among the people of Israel that do not yet know Jesus as Savior. We should pray and hope that those who belong to the family of Abraham by blood would be grafted into the family of Abraham by faith. Paul warns, Lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion, and he will banish all ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers." The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. The right response to this truth is to humble ourselves before the declaration, the revelation of our desperate need for Jesus. Jesus who came to humanity through Israel so that we might receive the mercy that is found only in him. But we must also marvel at the unfathomable wisdom of God that has wrought a plan of redemption that we could have never anticipated through the wisdom of man. Israel matters because Jesus matters. Through Israel, God folded himself into humanity and lived among us. The word of God become human flesh. However, Jesus did not just come through Israel. He is the embodiment of the true and the better Israel. He is the seed of Abraham through which the nations will be blessed. He is the true and better Isaac who was offered on the sacrifice of the mountain. He is the true Jacob who was sent to claim a bride for himself. And as Moses spoke the word of God, Jesus is the word of God. As David was chosen from the shepherd's field and became a king, Jesus Christ is the good shepherd and the king of all kings. Like Israel passed through the Red Sea, so too Jesus passed through the waters of baptism as a sign of solidarity with us. And like Israel walked through the desert for 40 years in rebellion, Jesus was tempted in the desert for 40 days, yet without sin. Israel was composed of 12 tribes. Jesus called to himself 12 apostles who would make disciples of all nations. Israel was rejected by God, but Jesus would be rejected by man. And as Israel endured judgment for their sins in exile, Jesus endured judgment for our sins on the cross. Jesus is the completion of the story of Israel. He is the fulfillment of all Israel's promises. And his resurrection, his ascension, the truth of his glorious return are the pinnacle of all Israel's hopes. This is the deep end of the pool. The plan of God and the miracle of salvation that point to a mystery that is beyond anything we could possibly comprehend. But even though we cannot comprehend it, we can stand in awe of its glory. 
So as we conclude this chapter, I think it's so appropriate that Paul concludes this section of Romans that spans from chapter 9 to the end of chapter 11, a, a, a section of Scripture that is full of mystery and big ideas. He doesn't inc- conclude it with a, a sense of confidence or a sense of certainty in the thoughts of man. He glories in the unfathomable truth of the depths and the wisdom of God. So let us join in with Paul and feel the the depth of these words, the weight of these words. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for your wisdom. Your wisdom that is beyond us, your wisdom that is above us, but nevertheless the truth that you have revealed to us that we might know and rest in your might, your power, and your goodness. Lord, help us to faithfully be your people. Help us with our words, actions, and deeds to show that we take seriously the truth that Jesus has died for us and risen again. Help us to be discerning and and suspicious of any motive of our heart that it would attempt to justify ourselves before you through our own works, through our own good deeds or actions. Help us to be humble. Lord, help us to long for and to pray for the salvation of those who do not yet know you. And Lord, even when we approach the the threshold of mystery, uh, of your goodness, your grandeur, your grand design for history, help us to trust in you. Help us to marvel at the truth of your glory, of your wisdom that is above and beyond us. We pray this in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.